Actually, how do you choose to talk about deep fakes? How do how would I choose to talk about them? What do you mean? I might, I might be giving away spoilers okay. here, but <laughs> you, can, you can ask questions, a, a pre Q and A before the the later Q and A. Okay. Do you have any ideas on how you can use these innovations in media and communications? Oh yeah, um, I've got quite a few. Um, so if anyone's listening, here's a million dollar idea. Um, I think I think deep fakes could probably I mean in a weird way we kind of already touch on deep fakes quite quite often and we don't even realize it a lot of the time um we've been playing about it with in, in photoshop in terms of like modeling um and advertising I'm glad to see glad to hear you're, you're enjoying it level um uh yeah so yeah we, we see it a lot in, in in advertising with photoshop and videos are just the next step so it's very interesting to see um well I think the innovations are going to be in how people find ways to apply it. I mean, I'll be, looking, I'll be talking about education shortly, but um, we, we can already see it in, in entertainment. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later in my presentation. We already see it in advertising. We already see it in um, in similar uses of what you talked about, funnily enough, um, where you showed, you know, the, the, the mummy, right? You say two Tutankhamun's casket, um, deep fakes could be used to superimpose, um, well, in visual effects, we kind of already do it as well, quite similarly. Like it could just be a green blog or, or a log, right? And then someone in post production gets on the computer and they, they have fun with it. And the next thing you know, we've got a, a block that looks like Two and Carmoon. So um, I think deep fakes are a bit like what you're saying about AR in print media, where it's going to be needed to be developed. Um, but it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be quite interesting because um, as I'm going to talk you about a little need bit to later. For make these deep fakes or it's another app program no i mean funny enough i mean there's, there's many ways to make a deep fake which i'll talk about in a bit um most people use um apps so there's one called the face swap what people use um oh you're breaking and, out uh -oh. it's just me I'm not entirely sure i think oh, we, can we lost tomar here i hope he comes oh. back have I gone anywhere? Was it? No. Oh, okay. I couldn't hear you. I don't All know. is fine. Oh, 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 it might have been you, Marietta. Sorry. Good, good thing. Good thing you're, you've done your presentation in, in, that, in that case. It's not um, it's, it's not kind of like halfway through. <laughs> yeah. Okay, two more minutes. Oh, Vernet says, interesting thing though, around how it affects general thinking cognition and how we learn as society. For example, the way how kids are being taught about using tech through the tapping action and the effects on creative thinking. Are you being too deep? No, that's what this that's what this workshop's for. You meant to be using your brain, thinking about things a little bit too much. Um, it is interesting, to be fair. Um, could AR be used in the medical field? Yes. Um, one thing um, I was looking at before I decided on education was looking at AR in in medicine. Um, funnily enough, one thing that it's actually funnily enough, the same technology being used for our bodies when we go into surgery is being used on a generator when an engineer wants to fix it when it's not you know producing electricity. Um, uh, a technician or a surgeon may go into I guess, the, the the surgery room or the uh, the generator room and you put on some glasses and the glasses will diagnose the um, the issue. So if maybe you have a blood clot, um, the AR the glass or yeah the AR glasses will allow them to scan your body um, rather than using your CAT scans MRIs or it um, shows the the doctor or the surgeon the information from your previous CAT scan so um, yeah CAT scan and MRI machine manufacturers need not, need not worry your machines will still be relevant um, but yeah it'll just be it'll just give technicians um, more information when they are, are doing things um, I think it's gonna be quite interesting in lab environments from what I was reading where right now we, you know, uh, I think they use spectrometer. Yeah, I'm a media student. I'm not a medicine. I'm not. I'm not in medicine. But they have, um, uh, like, you put in your your samples and shakes them up to make sure it's all being separated properly. And it goes onto a computer, and then the the technician will, you know, click through the computer, so and so and so and so. But then one thing they're worried about is um contamination of the hat on on your gloves, right? So rather than having the technician touching the computer, picking up what might be a potential contamination. Um, it shouldn't be because the room should be clear, clean, but they um, 
but yeah, less hands involved, the more accurate they can be sure of their results. So rather than having a screen, the information comes up on their, on their AR device um, and they're able to, you know, maybe scroll and read information directly onto the, the lens of their eye, which is an interesting one. And um, yeah, as a glasses wearer, that'd be quite interesting to try and see. I've read yourself. that, oh, sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead, no, go ahead. I've read that uh, brain surgeons are now, um, they're now teaching them how to uh, do the, sur um, the surgery on an AR model because you know the, the brain is it's the most complicated um, um, how is the word? Yeah, <laughs> I anything, forgot the word. organ organ and anything I mean it's really. the most complicated thing in our body so you can't just go and operate on the brain if you're not prepared but how are you going to be prepared <laughs> so yeah now they're using AR in brain surgeries uh, and also about the children uh, children's book uh, books uh, I was going to say, uh, I know many people who are saying that they're not going to let their children use uh, phones, but in practice, it's not like that. I've seen exactly the same people giving their uh, children uh, phones to interact with while they're doing something, even for five minutes. So if I, when I have children someday, I will be probably happy to give them technology, but use it in the right, right way. Like with AR, uh, just give them a book that can scan and uh, show them something, I mean, AR. I think this way, it is okay to use a phone. But with these meaningless games that they're downloading and uh, making uh, children to interact with, yeah, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I guess the question of overstimulation is an interesting one. Um, it's one of the things one of the things that we haven't yet seen in um, studies come up yet. The problem is, is that studying children is a massive ethical gray area um, and the results aren't always reliable. You usually need quite a few children and getting parents to um, yeah, sign off on their children being studied can sometimes be difficult, especially um, when we're looking at general population. Uh, one of the funny things that we see in academia is that a lot of the people who have children, a lot of the children studied are usually the children of either academics or scientists. Um, they usually end up getting the first round of, uh, of being studied on, which is very interesting. Um, for example, the first um, uh, CAT scan of a child was um, of the child of who did the study. So yeah, for context, those sorts of, it gets quite tricky. But um, yeah, we've we've gone way past, well, not way past, two minutes past um, uh, quarter two. But yeah, great discussion, everyone. Um, we'll be now moving on to, well, I guess a different presentation. We move on to my one now, um, where we look at um, oh uh, yeah, one part of the time. We'll be looking at um, augmented reality. So yeah, hello everyone. Um, again, same rules before as the previous presentation. Yeah, just you can just stay on mute. Um, there will be two activities mainly. Uh, one of them will be a poll. So hopefully um, you have access to that if you are at a computer. I'm sorry if you're on a phone. Um, I'm not entirely sure if the polls still work. Um, and there'll be another one where you can just um, get involved in the chat. So what you've been doing already has been fantastic. Um, so yeah, um, I'm the other intern finishing up their, their internship here. So before we begin, um, I know Marietta just talked to us about the term augmented reality, but before today, um, who was familiar with the term augmented reality? Oops. Hopefully that's, that's popped up. I'm loving 100%. Oh, got some good responses. Okay, so can't you can't vote. Oh no, this should be a democratic space. You should be you should, you should be able to vote. Um, maybe it doesn't allow other hosts to vote. That'd be a shame. Okay, so. The overwhelming majority of you are familiar with the term augmented reality, um, but in being fair, um, I, I will just kind of go back over the, the, the terms um, with some definitions. But yeah, thanks for letting me know how familiar you were with the phrase today. We'll go into some detail about that. So actually, before we begin, um, I'll talk with a story, right? So what you're seeing here on screen is Walter Raleigh. And he's famous for being the man who failed 
to find El Dorado. And the story goes that in 1594, Walter Raleigh hears about this city of gold somewhere in South America. And he goes off from England and he sails across the ocean to go and find it. Um, and he actually ends up publishing a very exaggerated account of, of what he finds there. And it actually contributes to this myth that we now know as El Dorado. In 1603, he manages to come back to England and he's caught being a naughty boy plotting against King Henry the uh, King James the first, sorry, not King Henry the first. Um, and so he gets locked up for being a naughty boy. And in 1616, he's been there for 15 years and James is a little bit tired of seeing his face in the Tower of London. And so he sends him off to go and actually find El Dorado. He says, hey, look, you've been bragging about this place in your book. Go off and find it for me. So on his travels, Walter can't resist being a naughty boy again. And he violates a peace treaty between Spain and England. And as such, he is then arrested and executed in 1618. Now, what on earth does a 400 year old story have to do with deep fakes and cutting edge technology and innovations? Well, fundamentally, the story is about how someone who has power can influence how an entire nation is thought of, an entire peoples, how they use technology. Admittedly, it was a book at the time, cutting edge. It's, um, and whilst an AR device is not a book, it is um, about cutting edge technology and how technologies are often at the whims of those who have access to it and who it ends up impacting. So today, when we ask about the ethics of deep fakes, we're gonna be looking at about how stories fundamentally impact learners. And we're gonna be looking at how distributing these texts is going to be adapted or how it should be adapted or might be adapted and how these topics are gonna to be remembered as well as a little bit, how the role that power fundamentally has in in playing how these things these things pan out. So I'm gonna show you a video. Um, hopefully the, yeah, the sound is off. So what we're looking at here is what we understand today as VR. As Marietta showed you, it's a fundamentally a 3D image. In this case, it's a projection of a woman who is discussing a little bit Star Wars style, you know, or hollow disc. Um, she's in front of a projector and the projector is, is mapping her movements. The idea here is that we can someday use AR in um, the workplace where rather than having these very 2D conversations on Zoom and on Microsoft Teams, we can instead go on and um, see people, see what they look like, adapt them so they can, you know, maybe you can be at a boardroom but you're the only person at the table kind of thing. But what exactly is augmented reality? Now, the Interactive Design Foundation say it's an experience in which digital content responds in real time to the user's environment. And what I quite like about this definition is that it agrees that there is a physical world that one that our bodies and one that our bodies interacts with, as well as a computer or digital generated input. And as such, it plays with our our senses. There's a problem with this definition though. It doesn't really tell us how many sensors have to be played with. Um, it, ex it actually ignores quite often visual media. Visual media is arguably the crux of augmented reality. As Marietta showed earlier, um, we, you may have a piece of paper, but we're looking at something through our phone. It also means that we are ignoring things like projector technology. That's considered AR. The idea that you can be at a cinema or you know, being in school, sitting on the benches and the hymns are being played in front of you. The projector showing that screen is a form of augmented reality. And so it also means green screens. You know, the idea that even in a virtual background is in some, in some way augmented reality. How would you know if I was an authentic Coventry University presenter student if I didn't have this virtual background on me right now? So what is the next step in augmented reality if we're already ignoring current or current technologies that fit this definition? And so we see things like green screens become this weird crossover period between what people consider visual effects and augmented reality. And the dilemma here is that what we end up seeing is a think tank marketing agreed definition of visual effects, technically being a form of augmented reality, but we treat augmented reality completely different from visual effects, even when the two are strongly linked. Now, what do I mean by that? 
So I'm going to show you a video of what is the same football match. And at this football match, there are, are four different perspectives you could have of it. On the top left, that is the signage that you would see if you were at the stadium. Um, if you, on the image to the right next to it, that would be the image you'll, you would see if you were watching on television based in the UK. If you're watching this image based somewhere in Europe, you would watch it on the bot. you'd be seeing the bottom left image. And I'll just play it again. Um, and if you were uh, somewhere else, anywhere else in the world, you would see the Coca-Cola imagery in the bottom right. And as such, we're seeing here that our perspective has been changed of this match, right? Not only are we having an advertisement tailored to us based on some geographic location that some publisher or media producer believes is relevant to us, but we're also having um, our, our engagement with the game change, right? How much more does the company there uh, bump somebody noir mean to me in augmented reality? Um, not very much. If I'm at the stadium, Bet Victor is a UK based betting company. So that matters to me then. And enterprise cars I can access in the UK, but Coca Cola is worldwide. It's a worldwide brand. So even in this simple game where we might be watching it for maybe the players, the skill involved, the, the outcome of the game, um, advertisers and media producers are already aware that they can use visual technology to impact our reality. And as such, I like to say that augmented reality is all about changing perspectives, like I mentioned that earlier. And as such, augmented reality in the eyes of a media producer is there to enhance reality. So I've got a quick question for you. Um, what sort of phrases do you associate with augmented reality? And you can just put this in the chat um, and we'll see, uh, yeah, take a look at what people are, are saying. That's going back, that's going forward twice. You are allowed to say, I don't know, that is allowed. Psychology, fun, VR. I like these definitions. Mind blend, interesting, I like that. Or oh, mind bend, sorry, not blend, I've added an L, well, there wasn't one. Creativity, I'd agree with all of these so far. Geolocation, data collection, yeah. See, what's quite interesting here in these definitions, AI, yeah, I agree, thanks. So thanks very much for your, your contribution. You can keep sending them in if you want. If you've got uh, 10 things to send, you can do that. But what's very interesting is that when I looked at how producers talk about augmented reality, they used things like mixed reality or the internet of things, also known as IoT or visual discovery. Um, they also use the words advanced machine learning or, or deep learning. And it's the only one which, which high, well, crosses the gap between what producers who create AR and augmented reality devices look at and what we as producers or, or consumers might, might use. And that's AI. AI is the only one which crossed over into two. We talked about how AR uh, impacts us, whereas producers see it as just a thing, right? It's just a tool that can be used for whatever that they see it as, but we see it as a, as a more personal engagement. And we can see this really come up in how it's being used currently. So as you might have seen from me um, sneakily giving away one of my um, slides, currently in education, we see AR being used um, to bring about learning parity, right? So if you are a, a, a visual learner, an auditory learner, AR is being used to help you be more engaged in the classroom, right? If a teacher is standing out at the front and they say, these are all the information I've written on the whiteboard, but you need to be more engaged with that information to be able to learn the topic that's being discussed in the classroom, you might be given an, a tablet or a laptop in this case um, that's being shown for you to be able to engage in that, that class um, more willingly. As such, it talks about accessibility because if we're making learning more um, fair and more, uh, tailored to each and every individual student, accessibility now becomes another way in which AR is being used, right? Currently, schools are going through a funding crisis, um, not just here in the UK, but throughout Europe. And what's very interesting there is that a lot of the special needs schools are being either closed or funding restricted. And so children who need extra support in their learning are being forced to go into 
um, more public, widely, uh, more widely available schools, and the support isn't there. And so AR in some places where the funding is available is being used as a way to allow children access to education that would previously, if taught traditionally, wouldn't have been accessible to them. In this case, a depth of information is being, is being given as well, or a further depth. So like I said earlier, the teacher might be sent up at the front with a whiteboard. Now they might be giving out a, uh, a worksheet but the worksheet might only be one A4 page, right? Maybe you need additional instructions that can't be fitted onto that sheet without the font getting so tiny you can't read it. And so AR is being used to potentially give students uh, more clearer instructions if they need it so they'll be able to fulfill the task correctly. And as such, um, schools said, oh, you know what? Rather than investing in you know, 100 reams of paper a day, why don't we actually use digital technologies to instead save paper and then we can we can justify the costs of, of charging these laptops up every day or every other day, but we can't justify how much we're spending on paper, especially as we move to more um, green technology sources. But it also means now that as learning has moved online in the past year and a half, teaching has become more trackable. And um, previously to understand how your child might have been doing well at school or not so well at school, you were almost relying on the teacher contacting you between parents' evenings. Now, uh, a parent, a child and the educator can all log into the same platform and see how that student is doing. Um, sometimes it's being used to gamify education, so to add in a competitive element. If a child sees that they're not doing as well as someone else, but they're a little bit competitive in internally, it can be um, a way in which um, they can see who's doing better than them and therefore can push, to push themselves to try harder. The negative of that is that it works in reverse, right? If you think you're doing the best in the class and you don't really care to for other people's education, it can become a source of bullying when you see someone not doing as well as you. And as such, the uses of AR in education have been about making education more attainable and more accessible, but not really about making it stick. It tries to, but it doesn't really do so in a way that is, is open or, or, or flagrant, right? It just talks about just getting kind of eyes on the on the material it doesn't really care too much about um, how well that, 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 that information is being absorbed or retained by students. Yet the opposite is true in entertainment. I talked about Pokemon Go earlier in mean, Marietta's presentation and one of the big reasons that it was such a hit in 2016 is that it allowed people to engage in their physical environments in a way that wasn't um, possible before. They could engage in what was at the time a 25 year um, franchise where they may have had characters or, or, or games or, um, or Pokemon that they've been collecting for years and they could now engage with them in the way that interacted clearer in their physical world. It was now on their phone, not just on a Nintendo device. And in this respect, um, what Game Freak tried to do, the creators of Pokemon, is that they tried to make their license, their ideas stick in a way that was that resonated with people in a way that was more personable way that they would engage with Pokemon in a way that was different, in a way that would engage with Pokemon that would be long lasting. So how does any of that do with deep fakes, right? So before I answer that specifically, what exactly is a deep fake? Now, Henry Adger from Deep, deep Trace Labs talks about deep fakes representing a revolution in AI generated synthetic media. It is a time or is a technology which asks us to take images and video footage and superimpose or digitally replace um, physical aspects of our world. At times, deepfakes also include audible and audio content. So um, in the case of deepfakes, it is primarily about changing the face of somebody to look like or represent somebody else. At times it can um, rep replicate or re replace their voice as well. Um, but what does that look like in context before I go into a little bit more detail? So I'm gonna show you a video. This video is of um, Star Wars' Rogue One. What you just looked at there and you're gonna see over the next minute and a half is the first deep fake I ever saw. It is of Peter Cushing, who you can see here on the left. His footage was taken in the 1970s, but he unfortunately died in 1994. Rogue One, however, came out in 2016. And so we have a bit of a dilemma here. How do you cast someone in a film when they've been dead for 25 years uh, or 22 years at this time? So rather than, you know, exhume um, Peter Cushing and be very unethical and animate his, 
his corpse, they've instead decided to hire Guy Henry. He's another actor who's about a similar body composition to, to Peter Cushing. And what they did is they used Peter Cushing's face and likeness and told um, Guy Henry to act very similarly to how Peter might have acted as this character Moff Tarkin. In doing so, they then took original footage from the 1970s, they digitally enhanced it to make it relevant for 2016's um, viewing audience, and they just placed it over um, Guy Henry's face. What's interesting here is that we are seeing entertainment want us to believe that who they're showing us is someone who has been deceased for 22 years. And that's very interesting because they want this character to stick. They want it to resonate with us in a way that has us believe the story that they're telling. The other side of that though, is that Guy Henry, we have no idea who Guy Henry is. Yet he's managed to get an acting credit in a film that we don't see him in. And this is very interesting, right? We're now seeing um, uh, an opportunity that entertainment producers are taking where they are encouraging they're encouraging people to um, take up roles that they won't be seen in. Here's another one of Princess Leia again. Um, she was not, again, this is um, yeah, footage taken from back in the 70s, again, to then be replayed in, um, in the 2016 film. So we can see here that, like I, like I said earlier in, in the pre-conversation of this presentation, that deep fakes are the next step in visual augmentation. It's the next step in photoshopping where photoshops take a static 2d image and alter it so that we then have a different perspective of that object deep fakes allows you that to visual media to moving media and as such deep fakes are also like augmented reality about changing perspectives deep fakes hope to enhance reality now there's a dilemma here if entertainment is about making these things stick making these ideas, these stories stick with us and resonate with us, how do we manage this new technology in a way that is ethical? And there's a massive dilemma here because historically deep fakes like so many new media innovations are reliant on adult entertainment. So in 2017, a user calling themselves deep fakes used Google's open source deep learning library to swap out adult performances, adult performance faces with actresses. And so what we have here is a new technology that can be used or is already being used to intentionally make entertainment more engaging, but has fundamentally questionable origins and continued uses in how it's being used. We are able to observe how deep fakes are being followed and questioned and used in um, in our current technologies, but we know that if we aren't able to adapt it or translate it to a, a mainstream source, that we have a, a um, you know, we, that we have a, a technology which is going to be potentially damaging. Right now, we're, there's already a crisis um, where women are are losing jobs because someone on the internet has taken their their, their Instagram portfolio and placed it onto a deep fake of an adult actress. And so we now have um, a misunderstanding of a technology that is being misappropriated fundamentally where there are good uses that can, that can be used for it. Um, Star Wars have seen um, an uptick in Moff Tarkin figurines that, that came out after 2016 and in the subsequent franchises that, they've, that, that um, Star Wars have, have commissioned, Moff Tarkin has, has come up again. And so we now see um, an audience from 2016 till 2021 who can now relate to a character or resonate with a character that they may not have even been alive to have seen play first time. So you may have questions as to how you might make a deep fake. I'm definitely not gonna ask you to do that because it's, yeah, very complex. Um, so in Spectrum Magazine, there are three stages to making a deep fake, right? The first is that we have to re require the training of a neural network, which is where the idea a few slides ago came up about um, deep learning. And in this deep learning process, we take video, like I said about Peter Cushing, um, or picture images, like I talked about the adult entertainers being, um, yeah, their faces being superimposed with people from Instagram. They take this footage uh, of a person and what they do is 
they give it um, they give this neural network an understanding of what it might look like from many angles. Um, as we understand uh, deepfakes to be a form of visual media, it's all about taking as many angles as possible under different lighting so that this computer can understand how it might be used or how the image that they then want to deepfake might be used. And so they then combine this trained network, which now understands what a face is from a potato, and they use computer graphics techniques to superimpose, like I said earlier, that copy of a face. So it's not even the, the raw image that we talked about earlier. It's not just going to be Peter Cushing's face or the person from Instagram's face. It's going to be a digital recreation of that person's face based on the information that you've given it of images or footage. And they placed it onto the existing face of the actor that's already there. And as such, there's, this is when the humans then come in and they adapt it here and there to make sure that, that the, the face isn't glitching out. You know, you don't have four eyebrows um, and you don't have like three ears kind of thing. So they make sure it all, it all works out. Um, now, there was a, an audit of um, deep fakes not so long ago. And we talked about GANs or um, generative adversarial networks. Now, what these are, um, are computer networks, from my understanding, these are computer networks which are um, algorithmically based, rather than throwing hundreds or thousands of images at it, it will, in, you instead, um, a bit like a video game, you do, you would put in the, what is effectively like a, a face generator. So I don't know if anyone's played FIFA or a fantasy game. There's like a character creation screen. Um, and in that creation screen, you can say the eyebrows are this high, they're this wide. They are, you know, the nose is this, this long, the, the mustache, they have one, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, they put in is what's called a GAN, and they put these parameters in, and it will then create a face. The difference here is that in um, a GAN generated deep fake, you are you are basically taking existing computer images that doesn't need to be translated, and then directly giving it effectively animated qualities. Um, currently, with a deep fake that relies on um, a neural network training, is that you you might be taking several. Okay, so you might know someone on Instagram who has a straight face in all their photos, right? How do you make that straight faced person talk in your deep fake? Or how do you make them, them lips move realistically? That might be a little bit difficult. With enough images, it might be able to do so, but uh, a, gen a GAN or GAN is able to animate that, that static image that you've adjusted or algorithmically. Uh, and as it says on the slide, these computer um, generated adversarial networks, GANs are almost indistinguishable from um, real faces. So that's where the technology is going where we can definitely say that there are now real people or, or fake people looking like real people in our digital technologies. And we've seen this currently being used on, on Facebook with bots, where there is a face that is essentially being generated um, algorithmically that is then given a Facebook profile. And they don't look like anybody you've ever met. There's nobody you've ever seen. So you can't even tell oh, this is this is like a catfish. It is a completely brand new generated face. And so this is where the technology is currently at, where in its development, the cost of its use has come down extensively. And so for, uh, and, and, and therefore we um, see in a, in a report by um, Sui Liu of um, SUNY Buffalo, um, most deep fake videos are generated by these GANs and they play a role, a very prominent role in the understanding of deep fakes because we now can move away from the unethical reappropriating of people's faces fundamentally. Where I talked about earlier that, you know, you throw in all of the, um, Facebook, uh, Instagram images, and then put onto an adult performer, very unethical, fundamentally seen in someone's likeness. Um, and in where we currently exist in, in the UK, you can have um, image likeness laws um, and copyright law where your, your likeness is licensed. Um, instead, people are now saying, hey, look, you can actually um, just create a face out of our imagination. And so we're beginning to see an interesting dilemma um, of a crossover as to which direction should we go in. Is this a technology that we, sh we have seen is has unethical roots and therefore we should leave it be? Or we can see that we had unethical roots, but we're now moving away from those unethical origins and can instead um, create images for good. But I would argue that just because there was an unethical beginning, the, un the unethical nature of it isn't necessarily rooted in, in what it's doing is how it's being done, right? So, I want to show you two examples of what are less unethical deep fakes, but we'll see how you feel. The first one is of Audrey Hepburn. Now, you might have remembered this advert from um, a, a, um, a Galaxy advert. 
I didn't know this was Audrey Hepburn, by the way. So here we have some 1950s Italiana. There's Audrey Hepburn on the bus. Um, this is not Audrey Hepburn acting. It's a deep fake of Audrey Hepburn or superimposed on one actress who we didn't know the name of because there are no acting credits on um, adverts that are so widely accessible. And so we have this person play Audrey Hepburn, but Audrey Hepburn technically also plays in it. So how this was sourced is that the estate of Audrey Hepburn was contacted. Um, they, the uh, Warner Brothers um, and MGM already had footage of Audrey Hepburn. Um, it was already in the library. And so they just requested um, from the estate of Audrey Hepburn if they would be okay in using Audrey Hepburn for their new, new advert. Um, Audrey Hepburn wasn't around to sign off on it, but the permission was given to use Audrey Hepburn's face, right? So that's one way in which we can see a slightly less unethical uh, defect being used. The next um, is one of my favorite ones. It's of my friend Yanni. Um, So Yanni's um, been deep faked here onto LMAFO by Ben, one of our friends. And as a joke, he says, hey, look, I can deep fake you into this video. Um, the joke being, hey, um, I think you look like the guy from LMAFO. Yanni says, no, so I can prove it to you. I'm going to show you this deep fake of you. Um, look, and who can even tell the difference? So like I said, we're at a crossroads now. How do we expand how we think of deep fakes? If we've seen that AR has already attempted to make education more accessible, and we've seen entertainers try to make their content stick, and we've also seen how technology has changed so that cloud computing allows um, the cost of these deepfakes to come down and be more accessible. You know, asking Nestle or Mars to create a deepfake of Audrey Hepburn is a different cost entirely than getting two friends to say, I've got your picture that you sent to me on WhatsApp, I'm going to use you as a deep fake. The cost has come down significantly, as well as the way that the two are accessible. And so what we now have is a potential to make um, education um, more compelling, fundamentally. And so we see here that, um, that the televised historical fiction can not be relied alone as a purveyor of historical content. Otherwise, audiences are likely to come away from historical fiction programs with a contradictory, skewed, and sometimes falsified understanding of the past. What we're reading here is that studies have showed, that of a review of these studies by, made by um, Catherine and Donahue, that studies show that the media based on historical events are a poor source of information because of their inaccuracy. Now, what's interesting here is that historically based media is also being used as the basis of documentaries. And um, we've seen this in um, either the History Channel's plethora of content or even BBC Downton Abbey, um, they've both been credited with an increase of interest given um, of these understanding of these sources, right? That by the public is understanding um, a rapid increase or the public has a rapid increase or registers rapid increase of interest in these topics. So for example, in 2014, um, the Windsor Museum had a 400% increase in foot traffic when they opened an exhibition on the clothing that was used in the time period of Downton Abbey. And that's fascinating, right? That we know that historical television isn't, can't be relied on, yet the public is using it to gain an interest in what is a serious historical period. And so there's another interesting, I say extract from the same paragraph, right? And that is to say, what we are gonna create, it rests upon viewers to actually seek out history museums to connect with what they're seeing in TV with what really happened. And as such, we have to talk about edutainment in a way where education and entertainment have similar interests. Their interests align, they overlap. And we can see it happen in what could happen in, in like, what could happen if we do this, right? And that could be in, you could see uh, a creation of industries in computer technologies and sciences. Currently there is a shortage. Um, at the same time, there's, there's a shortage in roles, but um, a, a, there's enough talent there to, to to create an entirely new industry where education and entertainment's interests overlap, and you can have computer technologies and, and sciences, people who have been trained in these industries, prepared and ready to take on production training um, to create deep fix for educational entertainment. We also have education training as well, where we now have 
cultural and heritage preservation being used as a way to encourage educational training, right? Um, if deep fakes are being incorporated and adapted by history uh, and museums, um, education can then be a way which is then made entertaining. And this is how deep fakes for learning can really enter the fray. Now I've used Harry Potter here because what we see quite fascinatingly is that of the first three books, um, a design of Harry Potter was given based on a loose translation of what the artist said of J.K. Rowling. From the fourth book onwards, we actually see a likeness of Harry Potter that is more similar to um, its actor, more so than the imagination that we have of Harry Potter. And like I said earlier, um, people are using media texts to get access to what they believe is true historical content. And so what we see here is that deepfakes have the potential to use people from cultural or historical figures um, and their estates and use them in educational training and educational media to make that educational um, content stick in a way that is accessible for children and actually resonates with them in a way that they can you know, use and, and reinterpret. If the idea of us is to teach history in a way that we don't repeat the, mis the mistakes of our ancestors, then surely making historical content actually sticks and they can remember it at a time when you know that mistake might come up you know they can avoid it could be quite interesting and because we already talked about media production what this could also do is actually broaden acting roles we talked about guy henry earlier on we didn't know he was in um rogue one yet he was given he had a job um a job to do and, and, and was given it now we have people who might fit the role but don't have the face for the role this is something that you hear about in in acting and theater circles where People can act the part, they can be the part, but the, the, their face just isn't right for the part. And as such, we can actually see um, people take on roles that they don't look like Cleopatra, they don't look like um, Winston Churchill, but they can act like them. And therefore we can just use their actual images that we have of them, they've taken from scans, archeological digs, et cetera, and use it in, in this respect. And so we can actually see a closer association with historical figures to the media that we use to represent them and to teach the current generation or our current society about these people. But there are ethical concerns here. There are several. The first of which, you know, who owns these images right, image rights? Earlier on, I showed you um, Audrey Hepburn. Um, Audrey Hepburn's estate had the rights to Audrey Hepburn's image, but he didn't have access to the actual material. And so if we talk about someone like Cleopatra or Winston Churchill again, do we talk about these estates? Because we can't look, look at the individuals. The individuals aren't around anymore. Um, unless we're going to be doing a biopic of someone who's already alive, um, accessing the individual is going to be quite difficult. And so we might have, you know, cultural heritage departments of governments um, being instead used to um, hold the rights of these individuals, right? Um, a lot of the time, about when, we talk, when we look at and talk about historical content, um, it's people who... Um, yeah, the, the, these are people who are seen as cultural figures. And so the, the cultural figure is being protected by their nation. And so we have to go to, like, should we ask the nation to look after the image rights of individuals? That's a very interesting dilemma because at what point does your personal image then get gets handed over to the state? That's a little bit of a, of a, of a dilemma. Um, if you're more of a, someone who's engaged in like um, Instagram, technically your image rights are given over the moment you upload your image on Instagram, but do you wanna give over those same rights to your country? I'm not entirely sure. Um, which images are we gonna be basing this fake on, right? Um, if we look at someone like Henry VIII, um, he was someone who dramatized his image, right? Um, when we see his big old portraits of him standing straight with his golden tunic on, um, he's not that thin, he's not as handsome. And as such, the dilemma there is, do we now have a fake um, understanding? Are we gonna deep fake a fake to then have a real um, understanding of a historical figure? That's a little bit messy. So what also the artist writes here, um, if we're using the images, um, like I said earlier, in making a deep fake, there are computer and human inputs here. So do we then give the artist rights and therefore copyright images or copyrights to a technology, to the company that owns the technology? Do we give it to the artist who might work for a company or works independently? Or if they're working on behalf of a country, then we've already given over image rights to a state. Do the um, artists also give over their their individual rights to the state as well because they're then using an image that the state allows them to use? That's a question we're also gonna to have to address if we take this any step further. How will actors be credited? 
Um, I've shown you two examples today of someone who was credited, Guy Henry, and someone who wasn't, the person who played Audrey Hepburn. So how will actors be credited in this um, new revolution if deepfakes are then going to be used in education or be an educational um, act in edutainment purposes? Um, should copyright law even apply here? I've hinted at it earlier. If we've already handed over rights to companies, legislators, or even or, or states, should copyright law apply? Um, currently, if you wait 70 years or 75 years, depending on you know the, the, the last statute to extend it to 75 years is about to come up, and so Disney might want to protect its um, earlier catalog, so that might be extended. If copyright law does apply, will um, individuals ever be able to keep, or the estates be, be ever, ever able to keep the deep fakes that, that were made of that person, of, of the person who the estate is named after? Um, do nations now hold on to copyright law here? And what's interesting is that copyright law, while it's been international, is not ratified by every nation. And so if we want to take someone from maybe, say, Tuvalu, or, um, but they don't have copyright laws that are the same in the US, um, what's the overlap there? Do, you, do we treat unanimously as nobody has access to copyright or everybody has access to copyright? And therefore, I talked about what we base the fake on. We also have to question if we're going to be using deep fakes in a fictionalized or dramatized history. You know, we talked about Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey is a fictionalized or dramatized history of Victorian England. Um, should we be using deep fakes of, say, Queen Elizabeth the um, First, not Queen, Elizabeth, uh, Queen Victoria the First? Sorry, uh, Edwardians, Victorians. Um, should we use Queen Victoria the First in that dramatized history? If the idea is that we're meant to be making his, uh, historical educational content that sticks, should we be kind of fast and loose with how we use it? That's a question we're going to have to um, really wrestle with. And how would this actually impact the quality of learning? And whilst I've talked about trying to make education um, stick in a way, it is speculative. These sorts of things haven't been done before. They haven't been tried yet. And so we have to question if the impact and the quality of learning is going to be what we speculate it to be. One of the problems that uh, we quite often run into is that um, people have this end of history myth where new technology will solve all of our problems of the past. And potentially I've, I've, I've bought into that with deep fakes. Will it actually do that? Will it actually accomplish that? And so lastly, can the costs ever be low enough to be seriously considered? I've already talked about an educational restraint, uh, budget restraints for, for education, uh, education centers. And so now creating even more learning material is going to be um, a, an additional cost, right? It's going to be, it's a different cost having just the actors come in, playing in dress, and they might perform for the, for the students or create a DVD or a, a, a video they put on YouTube and then the educator shows to the class. It's another thing entirely if we're then asking education centers um, to actually um, cover the costs of these production facilities when we now know that there is an additional cost there. So these are all things we have to um, consider. And so um, I actually have to open the floor now. Um, what would your suggestions be to kind of address these sorts of things, if you have any, or these are just things you might have to go away with. Um, I'm open to hearing them. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, so because you were talking about uh, historical figures, uh -huh. uh, how now uh, they can create uh, an image of how someone looks like, like Cleopatra, uh, Caesar, like they can do images of how they looked like. So yeah. if we, so not the we, but if someone uh, does an, um, a deep fake on historical figures that died like, uh, what, 500 years ago, it is not unethical. But if it is Audrey Hepburn, I mean, if we can see a real life Cleopatra because of a deep fake, I think it will be educational, it will be interesting, but when it's Audrey Hepburn or someone who died not that long ago, it is not the same. Do you get yeah, me? I, I completely agree. And I think that's one of the, 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 the dilemmas that we're going to have because um, whilst we might be able to scan, I mean, so for example, in researching this um, presentation, there was, um, uh, king, uh, king Richard III, he was a, he was a king who died uh, a battle in the, in the East Midlands and his body was exhumed underneath a, 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 um, a car park in Leicester. We have a scan of him. The problem of that scan is that whilst we have DNA evidence to tie it, to, to know it's, it was him, we don't have um, 
a scan that is representative of the images that we had of him. And so um, do we use the paintings or do we use the scan? We know that the scan is gonna be technically more accurate, but people understand or imagine him a different way than what he is. And so I completely agree that um, someone like Audrey Hepburn, we know what they look like, right? We have um, interview footage, we have hundreds of hours of interview footage, we have hundreds of hours of, of movies where we know what they look like because those images couldn't be altered up until now. How do we, how do we address um, that imbalance there? Because it's, it's, it's a tricky one. And I think that, um, uh, yeah, people are gonna have to address it. And yeah, Vernet says here, it's a tricky one, uh, how it's difficult to police the internet and costs might be low, but the legal implications will come with inherent costs anyway. Yeah, it is. It, and, and I think both of you agree there um, in that, I don't know if we have the answer, right? Um, quite often what ends up happening is that we create things, we create technologies, and then legislators have to, to have to chase it afterwards. Like right now, it's not illegal to make a deep fake of someone as an adult actress without their consent. Yeah, I would argue that when we already see, like one, it's already unethical to kind of steal someone's image and then use it however you want. That's a bit of a dilemma there. But also where we know that it has um, actual ramifications in their in their personal lives where, you know, that some people have to have their partners leave them because they think they've been unfaithful. We see um, employers, um, let these people go because they believe that they're engaging in um, an activity that doesn't represent the company fairly. Um, we, I would like to say that right now, if we're asking these questions about the ethics of how we might use deep fakes, we can potentially get ahead of, um, I guess, the more nefarious uses of it. And so, yeah, um, yeah, it's just one of those things I'm just gonna, I, I just have to like throw up out there. So yeah, you're, you're completely right, uh, Marietta. It's a tricky question. What about the voices? The, the voices are another, is another interesting one, right? Because um, right now, the only ones we have of, of voices are of people who we have um, videos of. Um, so, for example, uh, Tom, Tom, not Tom Hanks, um, Tom Cruise, sorry. So, Tom Cruise is the most deep faked man currently. Um, and we also have hundreds of hours of dialogue from all of his movies um, that we can synthetically create his voice in various ways. For someone like Winston Churchill, we have a little bit of footage so we can kind of do that. And so people like um, traditional acting, they, they either put their own spin on how that person sounded or they you know, might directly imitate, what's, what's he called? Like an impression of, that's the word. So they might do an impression of an actor or an actress. And so um, that's gonna be another big question when we go to people again, like say King Richard, we have no idea what he sounded like. We don't have a, a, you know, a recording of someone from the 1500s. Um, uh, and so we might end up creating a deep fake that is false in the pursuit of trying to make something true and then know entirely that it's fake. Like we're going to end up creating every, um, I like that, I like that logo. I'll come back to that, the, the, the two chats, but yeah, we end up creating, um, deep fakes for the future that we know was, was fake in, in the beginning. And, um, that's going to be a massive ethical concern and massive ethical dilemma. Um, so uh, Charmaine says, we have to consider the image maybe uh, biased, either the person's creating an image based on their own preference. So Cleopatra may be presented to children, something blue eyes, something like someone from New Zealand. Yeah, that's another thing we have to, we have to question is um, uh, what sort of creative licenses are we going to do, right? This technology isn't going to magically fix the, the divide between media producers and um, and historians overnight. It's, it's a technology that there are behaviors involved here that are gonna have to be um, wrestled with. Right now, uh, media producers don't create historically accurate content because they don't want to, they don't have to. It's gonna be way more interesting for us as a viewer to watch a dramatization. So um, the same is gonna be applied to images as well. Um, Lovell says here that don't be sound closed-minded, uh, but after hearing this, I think we shouldn't deep fake. Personally, my suspension of the, is, is disbelief is enough to accept any actor in any role. If you can pull off acting, then it's good enough for me. I'd rather have the new actor playing Tarkin and a deep fake. Um, for historical things, I like when they roll the credits and the picture of the actor next to a photo of the original person, if they have one, so you can see what they really look like. I find that one quite interesting. Um, and I think what I would, is it a counter? Because I don't entirely disagree with you. What I would say to that is that, unfortunately, your perspective of I can suspend disbelief long enough isn't a widely held one, unfortunately. Um, in the studies I looked at, it's only about 25% of people are able to dis, um, disengage 
a likeness of an actor or a person or an image from the actual person, right? So, um, and, and it even happened with a, with a fictional um, person, which is why I use Harry Potter. I don't even like Harry Potter, but I know, or when someone says Harry Potter to me, I imagine Daniel Radcliffe and I haven't even watched any of the films. And that's how, that's what ends up happening with people where um, uh, they can't imagine anybody else playing a certain role. And I'm going back to Star Wars again, because this happened with um, Ewan McGregor. He's arguably the most beloved Star Wars um, actor of all time. However, he's impersonating the person who played um, Obi-Wan Kenobi in the original 1970-something film. So people aren't able to, to separate. And so what we end up, might end up happening is that people will have an imagination of um, an actor um, and they can't separate it from the character. And we already see that happening when, um, uh, when actors and actresses get death threats because of who they played. And so we have to find a way to make actors and actresses' lives far more um, more pleasant to live in because fundamentally just because you played a bad character you did a job you don't deserve to be abused um, for simply doing your job very well um, unfortunately that's not a, a widely held um, yeah no, it's not, unfortunately that treatment isn't um, unanimous so we have to somehow protect actors in, in that way and if this means we end up using deep fakes to kind of attribute um, the worst of history to the people who actually did it I'm kind of okay with that um, but there are way more um, bigger dilemmas to have with um, defects, I would say. Um, another point from the education point of view, providing AR in schools could be a good to enhance learning, but is that teach, uh, is that tech, sorry, being provided in, in the home to low income families? Schools learning books for children to take home is a different thing than taking AR tech home. And also how is the impact of families where the parents' literacy may be low and then the figuring out how to use AR with their child, lots of rabbit holes. Um, another great one. So what you're talking about there is a digital, the digital divide or the digital literacy divide. Um, in North London, there are um, people who, uh, or charities that directly talk about this, right? And so what we have here is a, a dilemma where because education has been, I guess, removed from school learning environments. Um, yeah, sure, I've provided a, a reading list. Um, not all of them are relevant, sorry. I've, I've provided a resources list that will have some of the things that are in this presentation. As for the ones that aren't related to this presentation, I can get them back, I can get them over to you. Um, they just weren't included because they're not on the resources, but yeah, happy to do that. Um, uh, so yeah, in AR, so the problem right now that we have is that when you're in school, everyone has access to laptops, everyone has access to the same tablets, the school is responsible for them. Um, and so AR in schools is a, um, it's all accessible, everyone has access to it. Um, ideally in a perfect world, right? Um, assuming the schools have funding and they can offset the cost immediately to have enough tablets and laptops in instead of paper, it happens and therefore the resources are shared, right? When you access a learning database, it's not just one school has access to this one video, right? You, there are um, education uh, material providers who then go to multiple schools or boroughs or councils, about councils, boroughs, um, or even nations, and it becomes part of the national curriculum. So um, in the UK, there's a, um, a, a is it GMP? And it's basically a, a guy with like sunglasses on and he's got his big old book and he's got like, he's in math, science, English, everything. So someone like that um, would be like a centralized place where these materials would go on to, right? So um, this is where we have a bit of a question as to, do we ask councils to pay for this uh, or pay for production? Because they might be like, say a local, like a local Northern hero, right? Um, is relevant to Northern students. So do we ask um, council, individual councils, individual schools or academies to, to provide this? Or do we go to um, the Department of Education who runs the budget for the entirety of England and say, hey, you have to pay for it. The dilemma here is that, are we then looking at private schools? Is that, is that gonna include academies who are outside of the state school system? Is that also gonna include um, public schools or only public schools? And so that's another question that we're gonna have to answer as we get um, uh, into things. And so, um, <laughs> get council to reduce council tax first, yeah. So then when we look at a dig digital divide in homes, um, we have a false assumption that everyone has access to things, right? You, earlier on, Marietta said that like, seven, uh, four billion people have access to the internet and mobile phones. Um, that's four billion, but there's seven, people, seven billion people on, on earth, right? So what do we do about people who have to either share materials um, or gain access to them? Now, part of that answering will be in um, having education materials centralized 
so people have access to it if they're an education provider. Um, another way would be in simply addressing the digital divide, right? Um, this wouldn't necessarily, I guess, I don't know if it aids it, aids to it or adds to it, but it's definitely something that has to be considered. Yet, yeah, is it a dilemma that deep fakes in learning have to address? I would argue no. Um, that would be like saying that the school books provider um, has to address not everyone being able to have a book. To an extent, they should. Yet, um, if they're a commercial, if they if they're doing this for a commercial interest, then then we have you know the market. We have markets to, to address and inequality in markets to address that dilemma. If it's they're doing it for um, for like non profits and they're just giving out these materials, then then no, surely the, the, um, as long as the people who are giving out these materials have the funding to do so, then everyone would have access to these materials. So um, it might be a societal imbalance, a societal, a societal inequality that we have to address first before um, everyone has access to these materials in the way that we hope for. Um, because on one hand, we could have the BBC fund a deep fake drama um, and on the other hand, we could have, it could be linked, and, and therefore it's showed, sorry, so D, the BBC fund it, and then everyone, they tune into to BBC One on eight o'clock on a Monday night, they get to watch the same drama, um, like they have a, like did with Downton Abbey, or it could be linked to just schools, right? Um, it really depends on how we as a society perceive education, because if education is for everyone, then the BBC could do it. If it's only something in schools, then we have, to be dealing, we really do have to address that digital divide um, and inequality, whoops. Um, the divide comes into play if the Department of Education distributes funding to academy trusts and school and councils. The funding is then subdivided by trusts and councils according to each school's learning outcomes. So low performing schools may not get expensive equipment um, and agree to reduce council tax. I think we all want to reduce some taxes, but it's necessary if we want to fund these schools, right? If you want these schools to, to get the great education, that could be a thing. But I agree. Um, uh, like I said, the markets, a societal imbalance, these things might be addressed if we want to actually even have education that is more effective. Like I might be, I might be presenting a, a problem or a solution to a problem that is two steps away. Um, right now, if we have um, educational tools and equipment that is actually being given to, to, to students fairly, it's accessible to them, then yeah, we can talk about deep fakes. But um, uh, like I said, right at the beginning, we're talking, uh, both Marietta and I are talking about innovations um, to a technology that um, will, will require early adopters. And if we look at, say, the, the graph of how um, uh, new technologies are adopted, we have our very expensive early adopters. They jump on board really soon. Then we have, you know, um, or innovators, early adopters, and they get mass market, and then mass market goes on toward, towards laggards. So, laggards, sorry. So, um, right now, we're really on an early adoption phase where we're, we're even just conceptualizing if this is possible, if it should be done. Um, and I like how there is some uh, disagreement here by Lovell, especially, and agreement by Vernet. Um, but these things are things that we might have to look at because we have to address, we have to be understandable that understanding that defects are being used already. Um, they're already accessible in ways that we don't have control over. And so can we, I guess, manipulate these existing technologies to do things that make what we already have problems for um, better. Can, they, can we use these? Can we use these technologies to address issues that we currently have? Um, unfortunately, it will come down to money. Yep, um, to education and to make digital tech resources more accessible. Yes, we saw from COVID that there were drives to donate laptops to low-income families. The fact that there were donation drives instead of funding from centralized sources speaks to the fact that these innovations are useful, but they are not going to be accessible for all due to money constraints. Yeah, and that's why I say um, it's not even a um, necessarily directly a technology restraint. It's a societal imbalance, right? Um, because we know what the solution is. We know, we've seen that there is funding for these things. Um, yeah, I mean, in the UK, we had um, our previous Department for Education Secretary resigned because they didn't get the funding that they required just to cover this year's gap um, over the summer. So um, these are the sorts of things that uh, we're gonna have to address um, socially in, our social, in, in social inequality. Um, but yeah, we're coming up to two o'clock. Um, if, if anyone has any other suggestions or or, or things to throw in, um, feel free. Uh, Marietta, could you also, for our new joiners, could you throw in the feedback form as we, um, yes. yeah, thanks. So I yeah, um, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'm just waiting patiently here. Um, you know, with sure, student uh, books or um, student books, 
Actually, they don't have to be specifically made for the purposes of, uh, of AR. If uh, teachers are uh, educated enough on this topic, they can simply take a photo of a, of a page, put it on the app and do it in seconds. And after that, you can, I mean, they can add 3D object or whatever. And the book doesn't need to be specifically made for these purposes. The teachers themselves can do it. Um, and also about the, because you were talking about the ethics of um, defects. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's the same in the UK, but in Bulgaria, it is forbidden from like um, two or three years now to present a video or a phone conversation, any recordings in the court, uh, because there were wow. some uh, scandalous videos and also photos, phone conversations of politicians, and they claimed the, uh, they claimed in them to be um, photoshopped or whatever. <laughs> And they were not. It was obvious. <laughs> I mean, the people in Bulgaria, I'm pretty sure there are people in Bulgaria who know how to do these things, but I'm pretty sure they are educated enough to know not to do them to these people. Uh, yeah. So yeah, now it's forbidden in Bulgaria to present any kinds of recordings in the court. And I guess it should be made in any country now because, okay, in Bulgaria, obviously they weren't fake, but let's say in the UK or... USA, they could be fake and it is a problem. No, you're completely right. And I think that's why I kind of said right at the beginning that what we're looking about, even now, even now as we, we talk about um, societal imbalances and funding and is it going to be centralized, is it going to be specialized to just schools, is that we are talking about the seat of power, right? It's people who have the ability to either manipulate these technologies to do what they want them to be uh, or do what they want them to do, or is it going to be something that we as people are going to have to address and um, be aware of and I guess I can kind of take the reins. And then where is that overlap, right? Um, because yeah, <laughs> politicians could, could legislate the banning of deep fakes if they wanted to. Um, and if that's the case, then uh, this whole conversation is pointless. But if they don't, then we have to see that there is, a, um, uh, yeah, they're being used. And so how do we um, get a hold of, or get an understanding of these technologies whilst they're, they're going out. So yeah, um, Marriott has put in a, a Google Forms for you. Um, yeah, the feedback would be um, greatly appreciated um, in these closing 13 minutes or 12 minutes. Um, so yeah, as you do that, then that'd be great for us because then we can send it off to our, our, yeah, our supervisor um, and say, hey, look, we did it. Everyone's been very insightful. Um, I've used parents need to be educated regarding what the children have access to. Oh, I'm glad that. So um, yeah, feedbacks and the questions, if anyone has any questions, um, you are welcome to um, ask them um, now that I've kind of yeah, explicitly said, ask some questions. You are allowed to unmute by the way, um, but you don't have to, you can continue to type in the chat if you want, as you know, you've got yeah, 12 minutes. I think the people who are to be parents soon are, our age or close to our age, older, younger. So yeah. I think they, are, um, they have access to technology. They are educated enough how to use it. It depends on them whether they are going to show their children something educational or just make them play games. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because like, um, it's interesting, right? For the two of us, we, we study media. And so we have, I guess, a, a, a critical perspective of it. Like you talked about, I would, I would give my child uh, a tablet, but not to kind of play games or a phone, but not to play games. They have to learn on it. And then we have to kind of say, well, what is that? How much is that decision influenced by what we, we know um, through this internship, through our, our degrees, um, through our general interest in these areas, right? And it's gonna be quite interesting to see how other people um, are gonna adapt. Like the people, everyone here is, was here because I guess they either came to support one of us or they came to learn, or and or they came to learn something about deepfakes or or presentation. Um, uh, yeah, well, I'm glad you um, <laughs> enjoyed the presentation, Vernet. Um, apologies for trigger. We'll put a trigger warning in future presentations. Um, but yeah, take care.